Read Revelation 1 if you want to see the glory of Christ coming down at the end of time. In chapters 2 and 3, John writes letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor, a letter to each one. But those letters were written not just to each church. All of the churches were to read the letters, and then the letters were for all churches of all time, even for churches today. If you read the letters that he wrote to the churches, read them all, and you'll find yourself in one of them, I promise you. If you're a little, well, I won't go there, but you'll find yourself in one of those letters. Now, here's the interesting thing. The things which he saw, chapter 1, the things which are chapters 2 and 3, and then chapter 4 through chapter 18 describes everything that happens in the tribulation. Here's the amazing truth that I don't want you to forget. In the book of Revelation, the word church is found in the first three chapters 19 times. When you get to chapter 4, and you go from 4 to 18, it's not found one single time. You know why? Because the church isn't there. How do you know they're in heaven? Because when Jesus comes back in chapter 19 to settle things on the earth, he brings the church with him. How did they get there? They got there back at the beginning, right? <laughs> Robert Murray McShane was a brilliant, highly influential pastor. He was a poet in the 19th century. And he died of typhus before his 30th birthday. And many people thought that his life was wasted because he lived for such a short time. Yet in those brief years, God used him to accomplish more than most of us would accomplish in a lifetime. He conducted evangelistic campaigns. He set up a missionary program to reach the Jews in Israel. He was really on fire for the Lord. And I'm told that he wore a special wristwatch on which he had engraved these words, the night cometh. Every time he checked his watch, he was reminded that a time was coming when he would no longer be able to spread the news of God's love. And this reminder made him work harder than he ever would have worked otherwise because he knew there was coming a time when no man could work. McShane believed in this phenomenon called eminency. This is connected to the rapture, and it's really important that we wrap our minds around this concept. Because one of the key teachings about the rapture, recorded in several places in the scripture, is related to this truth. When something is eminent, it could happen at any moment. There are no barriers that need to be removed. There's no qualifications that need to be met before it occurs. Importantly, an event that is eminent is not necessarily immediate. It only means that it could occur at any moment. In his definitive book on the rapture, a friend of mine who's now in heaven, Renee Showers, gives this really interesting paragraph on what it means to be eminent. Listen carefully. He said, the English word eminent means hanging over one's head, ready to befall, ready to overtake one close at hand in its incidents. Thus, an eminent event is one that is always hanging over one. It constantly ready to overtake a person. It's always close at hand in the sense that it could happen at any moment. Other things could happen before that event, but nothing must happen before it takes place. If something must take place before it happens, it's not imminent. So the doctrine of eminency teaches that Jesus Christ could come back at any moment. And there are no signs for the rapture. There are no signs that say these things have to happen before he comes in the rapture. Now there are signs for the second advent at the end of the tribulation, but the rapture itself is something that could happen at any moment. A.T. Pearson wrote, eminence is the combination of two conditions, certainty and uncertainty. An eminent event is one that is certain to occur and uncertain as to when. I'm highlighting this term because the Bible presents the rapture as an eminent event, one that could take place at any moment, and this will show you why that doctrine is so important. First of all, Let's talk about some of the passages that introduce this truth. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. 
Now look specifically at the two action verbs in that passage. I go to prepare a place for you, and after the resurrection, Jesus didn't remain on the earth. Instead, he went to heaven. And the second of those promises is still to come. He said, I will come again and receive you unto myself. He didn't say, after this happens, I will come again. After that happens, I will come again. He just said, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And sometime in the future, I'm going to come back. And that event is eminent because it could happen at any moment. Paul emphasized this when he wrote his first epistle to the believers in Thessalonica. Here's what he wrote. Listen carefully. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to the salvation through Jesus Christ. Now, what is he saying? Paul emphasized the salvation of his audience. He's talking to believers. Really important that you understand that. All of the language in the rapture passages are addressed to believers. There's no language for the unbelievers. I'll show you what I mean. He described the Thessalonians as brethren, and he called them sons of light. They were saved. For that reason, why was it important for them to watch and be sober? The eternal future had already been sealed, as it is the case for Christians today. The answer is tied to the certainty of God's wrath. The day of God's judgment is coming. The believers in Thessalonica would not experience that wrath because of the rapture, but Paul charged them to invest themselves in the mission of reaching people for Christ because the coming of the day of wrath was, was inevitable and it could happen at any moment. And the same thing is true for the rapture. Paul wants us to know, Peter wants us to know, God wants us to know that Jesus Christ is coming back and it is imminent. And he exhorts the Thessalonians to watch and be sober. It is unrealistic that the church is going to go through wrath, but we need to be ready for the rapture. Finally and appropriately, Jesus' last words in Scripture are Revelation 22:20. 20. Do you remember those words? Surely I am coming quickly, Jesus said. That is the mindset we should live by as believers. He told us he is coming quickly. That means sooner rather than later. When I was working on this message, one of my church members gave me a card and it read, I'm not looking for a sign, I'm looking for the Savior. And I think that's the way we should be about that because he could come at any time. Now, here's some words that help us understand that this is not just the product of one or two or three passages. Every time you open the Bible and you read about the coming of Jesus, you can't help but notice what I'm teaching you tonight. First of all, Luke 21, 28. Lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. What does that say? It could happen at any time. Romans 8, 23. We groan, eagerly waiting. We're waiting for the resurrection. We're waiting for the adoption. 1 Corinthians 1, 7. Eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And on and on. There's 20 verses. I could read them all to you, one after the other. What do they all say? They all say Jesus is coming back. Our task is to be looking for him to come at any moment and not looking for something to happen before that time, but just know it could happen. Nothing has to happen before the rapture occurs. Can I get a witness to that? Amen. Now, the Bible doesn't give us specific information on the date of the Lord's return. If people tell you they know when Jesus is coming back, you should run away from them as fast as you can because they're not telling you the truth. The Bible tells us no man knows. The Bible tells us the angels don't know. The Bible tells us when Jesus was on the earth, even he did not know. So if you know something Jesus didn't know when he was on this earth, you're quite a person, and you should not be let loose for anybody to be hurt by you. <laughs> right. St. Augustine said, the last day is hidden so that every day should be regarded. If we knew exactly the day he would come, I know what we do. We'd mess around till the last week, and then we'd try to get stuff in order, wouldn't we? I remember one time my parents left when I was a young teenager, and this was the first time they ever trusted me to stay at home without somebody being with me, and I had a buddy who stayed with me. All I remember about that is we cooked for ourselves, and every single dish in our kitchen was dirty. They were all in the sink. 
We didn't wash one dish. That was before dishwashers were popular. And then we got closer to the time when we knew my parents were going to come back, and we started washing dishes. We thought, they could come now at any moment. Let's get ready. That's what we would do if there were a date on the calendar. We'd live in light of the date instead of in light of the days. The beauty of eminency is, the challenge for us is to live every day as if this could be the day. When you do that, it changes everything about your outlook. Now let me show you some interesting things about the pronouns that insist on this. Every word in scripture matters. I mean, every letter. The Bible says every jot and tittle in the Bible is important. There's a world of spiritual treasure to be found when we even look at the most simple things in the scripture and in the letters of the Bible. For example, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 and 17, I want to read these words. I'm going to emphasize a word. You see if you pick it up. We who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Emphasized word is what? We. we. Now, why is that important? Because sure. Paul is talking about this like it could happen to him. He is saying, in essence, because we know the rapture could happen at any moment, we believe it's going to happen to us. When the Apostle Paul described the Lord's coming for the church, he used personal pronouns that show that he clearly was convinced that he himself might be among those who would be caught up. All the way back in the New Testament, Paul practiced the doctrine of eminency. He believed he could be one. You say, well, then that really is something else. Look at all the time that's passed. We'll talk about that later. But let me just tell you, Paul believed in the eminency of Christ's return. He believed it could come at any moment. I believe that Jesus could come back and I will still be alive when he comes back. All of us should believe that. And no matter how young or old we are, we should anticipate his coming. Paul believed Christ would return during his lifetime and he expected it to happen. And the fact that Jesus did not initiate the rapture in the first century is not the point. What's important to understand, as Paul did, is that Christ could return at any moment and that the eminence of that return would spur us to live our lives in a certain way. If you knew for absolutely certain that Jesus was going to come back to New York before you went back to your home, I bet you'd be busy on the phone tonight. I bet you really would be. You might even want to go home early so you could take care of business. If you knew he was going to come back tomorrow, what would you do today? Well, eminency teaches you Teach yourself to live that way. Teach yourself to live as if Jesus could come back at any moment. Dr. Ed Heinsen tells the story of a great preacher of another era who was defending his belief that Christ could come at any moment. And the man suggested that those who no longer embraced the blessed hope couldn't sing a special hymn that he loved. Some of you old timers will remember this hymn. It goes like this, glad day, glad day, Jesus may come today. And he said, if you don't believe that, you have to change the words of the hymn. You have to sing, sad day, sad day, Jesus can't come today. I'll live each day and anxious be the beast and the false prophet I soon shall see. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that Jesus could come back at any moment. This could be the day. His coming is a glad day. And I pray that you are ready. So we've had the passages that tell us he's going to come at any moment. We've got some pronouns that teach us that in the word we. And thirdly, we have some parables that illustrate it. In Matthew 24, uh, Jesus tells some stories. Don't you love Jesus because of his stories? Jesus was the initiator of stories. Whenever Jesus wanted to teach something important, he would tell a story. Well, he told some stories about the eminency of Christ. I'm going to remind you of the stories. We don't have time to read them all. But then at the end of each of these stories, he made a very powerful point. First story he told is about an unexpected thief. This is a story about a house that was broken into by a thief because the master was not watching. The point that Jesus makes is this. If the master of the house would have watched, he would have kept the theft from occurring. But since the master did not know the hour of the day when the theft would occur, his house was unexpectedly robbed. Now watch how Jesus concludes this story. This is what he says. This is what this means. Therefore, you also be ready, 
For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not know. How many of you know a thief doesn't send you a letter and say, I'm going to rob your house on Thursday night uh, and just be sure? No. The Bible says the thief comes unexpectedly. And then he tells a second story. This story is about two servants. This is a more complicated story, but with kind of the same emphasis. He talks about two servants who worked for the same master. And one of the servants was faithful and the other was unfaithful. The master of them both is away from home and he's left them in charge of everything. So the good servant faithfully serves his master and provides food for the master's house. And the bad servant has convinced himself that his master is delaying his coming. So he gets drunk and he beats up some of his friends and both of the servants were caught doing what they were doing when the master came back. The good servant was rewarded with a promotion, and you don't want to know what happened to the bad servant. In the story, Jesus says that we should always be ready for the master to return. And we should never be doing something we should not be doing if we knew he was going to return. Like when I was growing up, and, and you'll, this will tell you a little bit about my family, I grew up in a very strict home, very strict. You don't know all the things we were not allowed to do. But one of the things we were not allowed to do was go to the movies. I'm going to tell you that I never went to a movie in a theater until I was a freshman, a first year student in seminary. I don't know what that says about me, but I waited till seminary to go to a movie. And one of the reasons I never snuck off and went to a movie was because I had convinced myself that if I did, Jesus would come back while I was in the theater <laughs> and I would be in a lot of trouble, you know? Now, that's a silly little story, but it's not a story without meaning. We should look at everything that way. One of the prayers that I pray often at the beginning of the day is, Lord, help me to take the influence of Jesus wherever I go. And if the influence of Jesus is not going to be comfortable where I'm going, help me not to go. Don't take Jesus where you don't want him to be. He lives in your heart. If you go places and do things that are not pleasing to the Lord, you're really not doing something you should do. Make sure you're not doing something that would embarrass you if Jesus caught you doing it when he came back. And then the next story is about wise and foolish virgins. It's a little bit longer and even a little bit more complicated. As you know, in a Jewish wedding was uh, protracted out over several days. And one of the things that would happen toward the end of the wedding was they would have a parade uh, from the house of the bride to the house of the bridegroom. It was kind of like uh, symbolic of the conveying of this woman from her home to the new home, which would be her home as the wife of this husband. So they would have a parade and often the parade was late at night. Here is the story Jesus told about that. There were 10 virgins, five were foolish and five were wise. When the bridegroom came unexpectedly in the middle of the night for the parade, the foolish virgins didn't have any oil for their lamps. By the time they purchased oil, it was too late and they found themselves locked out of the wedding where the wise virgins had been admitted. Neither group knew when this was gonna happen. They had no advance notice. But the thing that was true was, the one group was ready no matter when it happened, and the other group was unprepared. What does Jesus want us to learn from this parable? Here are his words immediately following. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man is coming. In another context in the book of Luke, Jesus said something similar, even more powerful. He said, blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you, he will gird himself and have them to sit down and eat and come and eat with them. Jesus is coming back and we need to be ready. That's the parables that Jesus told the story. So we have passages that tell us that. We have pronouns that illustrate that. We have parables that teach us that. Now, here's the principle that's involved in it. This is really a critical principle as you look at the whole story of the rapture. The eminency of Christ's return is more than just an incidental truth about the rapture. You may not believe this, but if you're a theologian, you will believe it. Major books and manuscripts have been written either to defend the eminency of Christ's return or to attack it. Simply put, if the Bible teaches that Jesus can come at any time, and that nothing needs to take place before he comes. If the Bible teaches eminency, 
then the idea that the church must go through the tribulation before the rapture occurs is found to be false. You cannot have something be eminent if something has to happen before it takes place. The rapture is eminent. There is nothing that takes place before that happens. You cannot believe that you're going to go through the tribulation before the rapture and believe in the eminency of his return because there's nothing that has to happen. You got it? That's why this is so important. Somebody says, what do you believe about the tribulation? I am a pre-tribulationist. What does that mean? I believe that Jesus is going to come for his church before the tribulation. One of the reasons I believe that is this very truth that we're studying. I believe the Bible teaches he could come back at any time. The Bible doesn't say eagerly await the coming of the Lord and then look for the tribulation because after the tribulation, he's really coming. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says at any moment, he could be in our presence. The tribulation is going to happen, but as we're going to see, the church isn't going to be in the tribulation. Let me tell you something that's really important. One of the most organized books in the Bible is the book of Revelation. Jesus gave the plot for the book. He said, write the things you see, write the things which are, and write the things which shall be. So in the first chapter, John writes the things he saw, which was the coming of God. Christ, and he describes him in brilliant color. Read Revelation 1 if you want to see the glory of Christ coming down at the end of time. In chapters 2 and 3, John writes letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor, a letter to each one. But those letters were written not just to each church. All of the churches were to read the letters, and then the letters were for all churches of all time, even for churches today. If you read the letters that he wrote to the churches, read them all, and you'll find yourself in one of them, I promise you. If you're a little, well, I won't go there, but you'll find yourself in one of those letters. Now, here's the interesting thing. The things which he saw, chapter 1, the things which are chapters 2 and 3, and then chapter 4 through chapter 18 describes everything that happens in the tribulation. Here's the amazing truth that I don't want you to forget. In the book of Revelation, the word church is found in the first three chapters 19 times. When you get to chapter 4 and you go from 4 to 18, it's not found one single time. You know why? Because the church isn't there. How do you know they're in heaven? Because when Jesus comes back in chapter 19, to settle things on the earth, he brings the church with him. How'd they get there? They got there back at the beginning, right? So what I'm saying to you is, if you study the Bible, and, you, and, and I have just immersed myself in this particular part of it, what happens is you, you get confidence about what you believe. The Bible is given to us so that we can study it and figure out what it's saying. And you know what, guys? I'm gonna tell you something. There's nobody here going to be able to ever make me believe that I'm going through the tribulation. I just know it's not going to happen. I know it because it's in the Bible. Now, and before we leave that subject, just let me make sure we understand. That doesn't mean we aren't going to have trouble now. The Bible is full of information about how, you know, all that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. We know that, don't we? We suffer. We have issues. I've had mine. But that's altogether different than the tribulation. In this world, we suffer difficulty. In the tribulation, it's the wrath of God coming down on the earth. And there's no way you can ever make it any sense about the wrath of God being leveled against his own people. That's not God's plan. God has a plan for us. And here it is. There's nothing that has to happen before he comes back. He could come at any moment. We don't go through the tribulation. We go to be with the Lord. Amen. So, how important is it that we understand that? It's important because it changes everything as to the way we think. Here are four words that describe what we should be like if we really believe that he's coming back at any moment. How should we live? Here's the first one. It's the word consolation. Paul concluded his teaching on the rapture with this admonition. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. The word comfort is a word that can also be translated encourage. Paul communicated the truth of the rapture to the Thessalonians so that they would not sorrow as others who have no hope. The message for the Thessalonians and for us is this. If you lose a loved one and they're a Christian, they're in heaven. 
and you will sorrow, but you don't sorrow as others who have no hope. Don't let anybody tell you that you're not a good Christian if you cry when somebody you love has died. That's a bunch of silliness. The Bible doesn't say we don't suffer and that we don't grieve. It just says we don't grieve like other people. That's all it says. And you know what? When I was in seminary, one of my jobs, I needed jobs desperately because I was trying to pay my way through school. I got a job as the chaplain at Baylor Hospital in Dallas, Texas, just a little ways from the seminary. To say that I had no clue what I was doing would be an understatement. <laughs> this was learning on the job, I'm telling you. And I had a little clicker that they gave me. So if that clicker went off, I had to go to the family room, which meant somebody had come into the hospital. There had been a death or a tragic accident or whatever. And I didn't know very much about it. I, I just learned to do my best. But what I learned was this. I got to the place where I could go in that room and within five minutes, without saying a word or asking a question, almost every time tell you whether the people in that room were Christians or not. If they were Christians, they sorrowed. But there was kind of a quiet dignity in their sorrow. And I have seen the other side with one woman, I'll never forget, down on the floor, banging her head into the carpet in the despair of her loss. The Bible says, if you believe that Jesus can come back at any time and that you're going to go be with him and that the rapture is true and the resurrection is true, encourage one another with those words. And you know, it's interesting. Pastors from that day until this have been standing in, in cemeteries as people have laid to rest people that they love. And they've been reading these words. Jesus is coming back. The resurrection is going to happen. And they've been comforting others with those words. And we do that because we know God has it. He's got us all in control. Amen. So, so if we believe that Jesus is coming back, which we do, we also believe that we should be expecting that. We should develop, a, and that's been kind of the whole gist of this message. If we believe he could come at any time, don't act like he's not going to come in your lifetime. Eminency almost requires that you have a sense of expectancy about his return. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who was the great English pastor of the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, believed the Lord could come at any time, and he repeatedly urged his people to cultivate an attitude of continual expectancy. Here's a sermon. I can't preach like him, but I'm going to try. Oh, beloved, <laughs> let us try every morning to get up as if it were the morning in which Christ would come. And when we go to bed at night, may we lay down with this thought, perhaps I shall be awakened by the ringing out of the silver trumpets heralding his coming. And before the sun arises, I may be startled from my dreams by the greatest of all cries. The Lord has come. The Lord has come. What a check. What an incentive. What a bridle. What a spur such thoughts as these would be to us. Take this for the guide of your whole life. Act as if Jesus would come in the act in which you are engaged. And if you would not wish to be caught in that act by the coming of the Lord, let it not be your act. What he was saying was, Learn how to live with expectation that Jesus is coming back. We have to get over the idea that the rapture is a doctrine, that it's some kind of thing we believe. It's a part of the church's creed. It needs to be a motivation to us. We need to learn how to expect Jesus Christ. The more Christians are caught up in enjoying the good things of this life, the less they are going to be caught up in looking for the Christ to come. Many Christians who are experiencing suffering and persecution, if you went to those nations, you would know they talk about Jesus coming back every day. Dr. Gruden suggests that the idea is not merely to watch for Jesus coming, but to actively engage in preparing for his coming every day. Consolation, expectation, consecration. Many New Testament passages use the return of the Lord to motivate us to be greater in our service for him. I'll just give you one illustration. Here is 1 John 3, 2 and 3. Listen to these words in light of what we've been talking about. Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. In other words, if you really believe Jesus is coming back, 
You're always looking to be more ready than you were before. You know, sanctification is not something that happens all at once. You don't become godly in a moment. But over the period of time, as you reflect upon who he is and what you're going to be when you see him and life as it is, you should be noticing changes in your life. Things that once were a part of your life that are falling off like scales and you're living in a different way. As followers of Jesus, our life is a continual journey of getting more and more ready for his return. Then finally, we should be examining our own hearts. We don't do that very much anymore. We don't take time to do it. it. Used to be when I was growing up, when we had communion at church, they would have pauses between the delivery of the elements and you would be told to take some time to examine your own heart. Anybody remember that? Now we rush through it. Ten minutes later, communion's over. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong. I'm saying if that's not it, there needs to be some time in our lives when we take some moments to examine ourselves. Suppose the Lord Jesus chose this very moment to return. Would you be ready? He warns us that he's coming quickly. When that moment strikes, there's no time for you to get ready. So the question you must ask is this, have I committed myself to Jesus Christ? There's an old story about an older man who worked in a factory. He had the reputation of always being the first one out the door when the whistle blew at the end of the day. And he had his jacket and his bucket and everything that he brought in. And one day they went to that man and they said, how is it you're always out of here first? How is it you're always ready to be out the door before anybody else? And here's what he said. He said, I stays ready to keep from getting ready. There, there you go. Isn't that the right thing? Isn't that what we should do? We need to stay ready to keep from getting ready. Can I get a witness to that? Amen. So, what do we know about the Lord Jesus Christ? We know that he's coming back. We know that he's coming to get us. If we're Christians, we're going to be caught up to be with the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. But we don't want to just live in that future thought. We want to let that future thought change the way we live. You may be listening to this as an unbeliever, perhaps out of simple curiosity, and you've never recognized Jesus Christ as your Lord. I hope you will do it today. Do you know the people of Taiwan understand the doctrine of eminency? They truly do. For more than 70 years, Taiwan has been under the threat of an invasion by the Chinese Communist Party. The question is not whether China will attack Taiwan, but when. Taiwan must be ready for a conflict at any time, says their defense minister, noting that Taiwanese military is capable of mobilizing more than 200,000 soldiers within 24 hours. That's the kind of readiness we need to maintain as followers of Jesus. We need to be ready. We are on the cusp of an invasion, not a hostile one, but a friendly one. Jesus is coming back, and we need to be ready. Amen? And I hope you're ready, and I hope you will use these thoughts on this truth to examine your own heart. If you're not a Christian, you need to become a Christian. You have no guarantee that you have a long time to think about that. The Bible is filled with truth that today is the day of salvation. If you're a Christian, and you're just playing around with your Christianity. Stop doing that. Get serious. Realize you could meet the Savior. The one who died for you on the cross could be standing in your presence at any moment. And don't be embarrassed when he comes. Can I get a good witness for all this truth? Amen. And now, with one last word for today's program, here is Dr. Jeremiah. Who among the followers of Jesus wouldn't be thrilled to hear the blast of the trumpet, catch the shout of the angel, and feel the upward pull of the magnetic, rapturous grace of God calling us out of this world and letting us see our Lord Jesus face to face. The most important question is, will you be among Christ's followers who are raptured? Pray that you can answer with a resounding yes. But if you're unsure or find yourself not knowing Jesus Christ in a personal way, I want to invite you to put your faith in him today. To help you, please allow me to send you two resources from Turning Point. 
One is a booklet called Your Greatest Turning Point, which will introduce you to Jesus Christ. The second is my monthly devotional magazine, Turning Points, which will inspire you to grow closer to God into the future. And I will gladly send these resources to you completely free if you'll just contact us here at Turning Point today. Next time on Turning Point. The Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days before the Lord comes back. And we know how it was in the days of Noah, and we're seeing many similarities creeping into our culture and the way of life. Join Dr. Jeremiah next time for his message, The Noah Factor, here on Turning Point.